I'm so glad to see all these young, beautiful people. Although the story that I'm going to tell you, it's not such a happy story, although, although I am alive, so it's, it's happy for me. And I raised a beautiful family too, so it's good, all good. I made some notes because I don't want it to I was born in a very wrong time and in a very, very wrong place, middle of Europe, Poland. I had lovely family. I had father who was an accountant. I had mom who was a seamstresser and she had a little business out of the house. I had two older sisters and one younger. I had an extended family, large extended family, grandparents, uncles, aunts. We were just a very simple middle class family, a very, a very busy family and happy. To explain a Holocaust, it is a very difficult, difficult thing to be. Uh, the Holocaust, uh, if you look in, diction in dictionary, it will tell you that it's, uh, that it's uh, um, that it's a ending of, of some some one group of people or something, I don't know. Elie Wiesel visited Kent State University and, uh, and tried to explain Holocaust and he couldn't, he couldn't. He spoke many languages and in any language there was no explanation. To, f to find a word to describe a Holocaust is impossible because uh, Germany, the most advanced country in the world at that time, in all areas, they made industry a very, very, um, very precise industry out of murdering and killing people innocent people, men, women, and children. Their educated engineers built concentration camps. Their educated chemists provide chemical for guest chambers. Their educated nurses and doctors made all sorts of experiments on people, especially twins. Dr. Mengele was the one that is very famous for that. He would put a young children, one would put in a ice box and see how long it would take till he dies. And his brother or sister in a just ice water and see which one die first. My message is, well, my introduction actually to war was, um, I had no idea, I was a child, I was about six, five or six years old, 
And my introduction to war was really, um, I was playing with a whole bunch of children on a, on a playground that was Sunday. Uh, I wasn't in school yet, so, and they were playing food, uh, football, it's not really football, soccer. And I was watching with other girls. And in one moment, the ball flew ne about next to me and ended up in a ditch. Well, I thought, here is my chance to do something. So I ran after the ball to the ditch. And in that second, in that second, all of a sudden, we hear these planes were flying very, very low and, and with shrieking noises. And all of a sudden, bombs started to fall on the playground and everywhere. And where there was a sunny, beautiful morning, it became dark. And debris were falling all over the place. I was clutching the ball to my chest and standing in the ditch. And then all of a sudden, some, it became dark. And all of a sudden, it's grabbing me. somebody's grabbing me and carrying me away. And that was my father. And I, I had no idea what happened so fast, so fast. I have never seen the children after that were playing. They were no longer, they were all killed. And things begin to happen very quickly after that. I remember standing with my father, watching how the Nazi soldiers were marching in the city, on the street, and singing a song. And the, and the group of Lithuanian people welcomed them. They were, they were looking actually for them to come. And uh, things begin to happen very fast. There are all sorts of proclamations that for Jews not to not to venture out of the house for after five o'clock, and if you if you do, you would be killed. There were uh, Jews were not allowed to walk on the sidewalk. You had to walk in the gutter, where the uh, and all sorts of all sorts of proclamations. No work, no school. All the businesses were taken away, and they and and they would just stay inside. That was the safest place for a very short time. And then soon after that, they, uh, they, uh, the Nazis came and told us to get out of the house and carry whatever you can and just get out of your houses and gather us in a, get, uh, in a marketplace. And uh, I remember watching how they put, how they, uh, put the stamp on our door and before they did this, taking out my father's, my father was quite a musician. He had all sorts of musical instruments, like uh, string instruments, like guitar, balalaikas, and mandolin. And uh, uh, I saw them taking out of our house, putting on a truck. I didn't understand none of this. I didn't know nothing what's going on. And there is nobody to explain to me. My parents didn't talk about it. They were just scared and uh, held us close to them. Anyway, and the march started. We lived in the city, actually, so there was a, the march started in one direction to ghetto. They brought us to ghetto. Now, when you talk about ghetto, you need to understand. I, I heard somebody say that there was get, were ghettos in the United States. Well, that would be heaven for us, because the ghetto that we went in it was with barbed wire all around, or brick, brick walls, very high. And the machine, the, the Nazis with machine guns were all, all around. We were given, given a small room, small room, maybe like 15 by 20, maybe 25. And that room was divided by a curtain. And we had to with another, share that room with another family. There was no uh, electricity there. There was no bathroom there. There was no kitchen there. So to bathroom, you had to go outside in wherever place you can find. Water you had to bring from outside also there was. And, uh, and uh, during the night, if you had to go to the bathroom, well, you had a little container and you had to go to that container. 
and that's, that's how it was. The life in ghetto was a sheer hell. I think if I committed the worst crime in the world, I will not go to hell because I have been there. There was no, <coughs> you would see on the streets, people were dying from hunger. Ch children were the ones that already lost their parents sitting on the streets and, and crying and, all, uh, and sleeping on the streets. The bodies all over, all over the places, they couldn't ca carry them away fast enough uh, to some place, I don't know where. And uh, from time to time, the Nazi soldiers would come with the trucks and the dogs, uh, shepherds, German shepherds, although I like dogs, but this, uh, the German shepherds. And they would, if they would see an older person praying, uh, covered with a prayer shawl and praying, they would let the dogs on, the, uh, on, on that person and they watch, they watch how the dogs would rip that part to, to parts, the parts of that person, were making pictures and, and making fun. My uh, father and mother were worked in a nearby factory and, uh, and they, they left us, when they went to work, they left us in children's center. I don't know what else to call that. I, I, you know, we were not allowed, there were no schools. So there's a place that, that two or three women were watching a whole bunch of children, maybe 150, maybe more, I don't know. But those were little kids. The oldest one probably were like I, which was six years old, about. And uh, my sister was only three years old, the, the, the younger one. So that's where, that's where they took us and, when, and then they went to work. And then they would come and pick us up. One day, one day we see uh, like school buses, except the brown school buses, they drove into that, right in front of that, uh, of our uh, place. And few Nazis came out and talked to the, to the women that were taking care of us. And a little bit later, they started to call names. And so two by two, little kids were walking to the, to the bus, to the buses. I don't know, nobody told me, but I had a feeling that this is not, not a good place to go. So I, I, I took my sister by the hand and I hid behind the, behind the bushes there. And I watched and they, they, they fill, filled up the buses with the children and, and drove away. There are some kids were left because not all of not all of because there are quite quite a few kids in the building. Anyway, that evening, we could hear from far away the cries of desperation. Parents were running and looking for their kids that there were no there no more there. And I felt my father and mother grab me and my sister and move fast went away from there and came to our little little half a room that where we lived. My, for the first time, my father put me on a stool and looked at me and say, listen, Barbara, he called me actually Basha, that's my pet name. I have to tell you something and you need to understand, it's a, it's a very bad war going around. And for us to survive, we have to separate. I, with your sister, will go another one place. You will go to the person that will come to pick you up pretty soon. And you know that person. That person used to deliver milk to, to, to us. And uh, you know him and he will pick you up and you will go to his house. If somebody is asking you who you are, you just tell them that you, are, that you belong to that person and that uh, your name is Barbara, and this is my sister Leah, and, uh, and I don't know where my parents are, 
and uh, uh, that's it. Don't say anything else. And if somebody is asking you, no matter what they ask you, you just look at them straight. Don't say anything. Just be silent. Don't say your last name because my last name was Gorowitz, which was which was very Jewish, and so you could, didn't have to say that. You just say first name, and then don't say nothing else. Well, I remember that very well, and I certainly did exactly what my father told me, but I didn't understand why. Why do we have to do that? Why do we have to do that? That he didn't, un that he didn't say. He just told me that the war is going on, and that we're going to be very short time with, the, with this uh, person that we, we're going to, it's a farmer. That, uh, that they live near, near the city that I was born, Vilnius. So, uh, uh, and then that they will come and pick us up very soon, not, not very long. They thought that the war is going to last a very short time. Anyway, we end up with this farmer. He had seven children, much older than we were, and they were nice kids. And we stayed there, I don't know how long, I cannot tell you how long that was, but I think it was the whole summer and maybe part of the fall. And one time in the, uh, during the fall, I overheard the, the wife of the farmers say to him, to ma Friday was, uh, was marketplace. When you go to marketplace, when you go to market tomorrow, take the two Jewesses with you and take them, take them to Gestapo. Now I didn't know exactly what Gestapo is, but I didn't. I, I feel it wasn't. It had. It was not very good. I, I didn't know, but um, take them to Gestapo, and you go and get for this uh, 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 quite a uh, truckload, or uh, I guess a bag full of sugar beets. Uh, exactly. I. I don't. I, I think like a sweet potatoes, maybe uh, sugar beets, whatever that was. And, and, uh, uh, and if you keep them, we're going to be in trouble, which was, by the way, true. They would, if they would be discovered that they keep two Jewish children, they, the whole family would be in, uh, probably taken to a jail, or not to a jail, to a concentration camp, or maybe killed on the spot. So they were taken care of, but I didn't, I didn't know that at the time. So uh, when I heard this, I was, I, was, uh, I was afraid to wait till the morning. And we didn't sleep in the house. We slept in the, like a vestibule uh, on a, it was a fire. They had a big fireplace that they cooked in that fireplace. So the part that they cooked, it was in the, in the house. The, the other part was outside, like in a vestibule. So that's where we slept on top of the, on top of that fireplace, which was very nice and warm. So uh, when I overheard this, I thought to myself, how am I going to, my sister was already asleep, how am I going to, to, to tell her? My sister wasn't very easy a child, <laughs> she was not quiet either, but she was asleep. <laughs> so I thought I'm going to snuck into the pantry and I'll slice a piece of bread. And I did this, but the thing is even to slice a bread, because they were baking bread for the whole week, which would be the size of half of this table. Uh, <laughs> to, to slice from something like this, a little girl, that's not an easy thing to do, but I finally did it. On my way out, I saw the jars that was on the shelves, and it looked like honey, because they did honeybees. So I, I thought, well, I'll, I'll just, so I open up one jar, it was covered with a cloth. I open up and I put that that uh, honey on top of the bread, and I came to my sister. I climb up and I say, "Leah, Leah, listen, here, here is bread." And she always was hungry, always. <laughs> so, so I, I I I put it right in front of her nose, and she grabbed it fast. And I, and I uh, didn't wait, and I said, come on, come on, let's go, let's go. And she was quiet, and she was eating the bread and the, the honey, and, and we walked out from the, from the house, from the place. And uh, where do you go? It's the middle of the night, there's no lights, there's no sight lights or anything. Where do you go? Do you go left, or do you go, do you go 
left or do you go right? Well, I chose to go right. <laughs> so we, we went and we went and we went and we ran and she was still eating. And then I see that bubbles are coming out from her face and nose. And, and I said, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. I, I, instead of, I didn't realize that that was soap that I gave, that I put on the bread, mm -hmm. uh, that they had a soap. And she, so I want to take it away from her. She started to scream. I said, well, go I gave it back to her. <laughs> <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, and here the soap and bubbles and were coming out. And we're running, we're running. And we came to a place that, were, that had kilns uh, where they made bricks. And so, and how far was that from the village? I, 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 I can't tell you. So, but but it, we were tired by then, so we went down, I took her, she was still eating. She was still eating, you know, and, and we sat down next to it and pretty soon we fell to sleep because the killing was still warm. And uh, we were awakened by the hoofs of the horse and I looked up and I saw a priest sitting uh, in a buggy and he, when he was pass, passing by, he looked at us, but he didn't stop. He kept going. And then, and then uh, so, so we just uh, fall to sleep again. And then a little bit later, I don't know, maybe half an hour, maybe an hour later, the same, the same priest was going back. And this time he came down and he asked, uh, he asked me, who you are. So I remember what my father told me. I say, I am Barbara. This is my sister Leah. A bam, fe a bam fell on our house. We don't know when anybody is. And, and, and that's it. So he s looked at us and smiled, had a kind face. And he asked, would you like to come with me? Sure. You know, so he picked up my sister and uh, a very disagreeable sister. And and uh, uh, took me by the hand and put us in his buggy and cover us with burlap and hay, and hay uh, on top. Uh, he knew, he knew who we are probably, but, and took us to a place that was part of the convent. And uh, we were supposed to stay there, I don't know how long, but we were told not to venture outside never ever to venture outside, not even to the garden where there were flowers and all this, not to go out. I, I did not, I, I was most of my life, I was very compliant, but one day, Sunday, after church, after everything was so nice, I, I disobeyed, I went outside. And I went outside a little bit farther and farther, uh, the city that I was born, Vilnius, and the, all the area, it's a lot of woods, a lot, uh, lot of forests and woods. So I went a little bit farther, and before I knew, I w I'm in this forest. And I hear noises there, strange noises, pa, 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 like shooting, but except I didn't recognize shooting, I just that kind. So I went a little bit farther to see. And what I see, I will never, ever forget. I wish I could erase this from my mind, but I couldn't. I saw a whole bunch of young women holding little children to their bosoms. They were naked and standing around. A, it, 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 it's like a, in huge, like a huge grave. And just few soldiers were shooting at them and they falling. They, they were falling, but the children were still alive and they were falling. I was so scared. I could not move. I was watching and could not move, could not. I was frozen. And all of a sudden somebody catches me and drags me, drags me back. It was one of the nuns that, uh, that I disobeyed and dragged me back to the to the convent. I don't know how they, how the nuns communicated, how they communicated with each other. I didn't see the phone over there, but maybe they had a phone. I don't know. But the same evening, the priest 
came and uh, the same priest came and took us back to the, on, the, on the buggy, cover us with a burlap and with hay, and, and, we, and we end up going back to the city. Uh, it was a long drive. And when we came to the main convent, main church and main convent, uh, which, was a, which w had a big gate around, and, uh, and uh, they were waiting, I guess, for us already because they quickly opened the gate and we went in. And, uh, and that's where we remained for a very long time. We were also told not to venture, not to go, uh, not to go any place without, without telling anybody. The life in convent was very peaceful. We were taught. We were helped with, with uh, oh, and my sister was, uh, was, was had, to, had to be taken care of because when we were with the farmer, she, she grabbed a piece of bread before, before the prayer, so he threw a knife at her, and so the knife injured her and uh, became infected. So the nuns afterwards were trying to heal, to heal her, but that was, but took very long time because they did, they put some tar and then they tore out and she was screaming to the high heaven and I, and I was, I, I, I was so frightened, I thought they are torturing her. Mm -hmm. uh, well, anyway, they did heal her at the, finally, but it took a long time. Uh, we were in the convent, we were taught there was only one nun uh, was assigned to us to teach us reading, writing, arithmetic, and uh, of course the religion, but uh, nothing else. Uh, nobody told us that the war was over, over. Only two years later, in 1947, we found out that the war was over. Nobody bothered to tell us that. We had no idea. One day, one day, a uh, tall and very good-looking lady. She she had very dark, she had black hair and beautiful complexion. And here, and and here, I see a lady, a, a little lady, sitting with a with a scarf, babushka, like sitting, and uh, with glasses, and uh, looking at uh, looking at me, and she didn't look at all like my mom. So I turned around, I smiled to her, and I looked at the priest, and I smiled, and I started to walk away. And she started to call my kind, my kind, my child, my child, Basha. Nobody called me Basha, but this is a bad name. And uh, my kind, so I turned around, and I recognized this by the voice. And she says, she says, you're my child, Basha, you're my child. And, and I, I recognized her voice, and I came close, and, I, and she grabbed me and, and, and embraced me and says, where is your sister? And I say, my sister <laughs> pretty soon will come here. And so, and so we, that's how we got reunited with my mother. I made her promise that she's going to come to the church and that she will become Catholic and uh, Christian, and that, uh, that we will be all happy together. Well, she says, yes, 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 she promised everything. Except, didn't happen like that. Uh, very soon after that, uh, she brought me home uh, where she lived, and she introduced me to a little boy about three or four years old and tells me it's my brother. My brother was a holy terror. He was impossible. He was impossible. I never saw a child like that. You know, he looked a lot like my mom, but apparently he, he, he survived and some, he survived with a, with, a fami with a Catholic family and that claimed that this is the, uh, their child. But he looked like my mom. Anyway, I asked my mom, give him back. <laughs> Let him go back. <laughs> yeah, because now I have to watch him. I don't want to watch him. Well, anyway, so 
we couldn't stay in Lithuania. That was in Poland. Uh, at, when I was born, Vilnius, that city, it belonged to Poland. But then soon after that became Lithuania. So we couldn't stay there. We couldn't stay there for many different reasons. Lithuanian people collaborated with Nazis and they, it was not a safe place to stay. So, uh, so uh, uh, there was ma made arrangement for us to get away, to get away from Lithuania to Poland. We came to Poland and uh, we came to Poland and in Poland was, Poland was very communistic and also not a very good place to be. So my mother started to make a arrangement to get away from Poland. And so we emigrated to Israel. My message actually <coughs> is very simple. Never, never stop learning continue to learn, continue to grow, continue to enrich and explore, but never, but most of all, connect, connect with other people. Connect with the world around you. Connect with the, with the people, all different kind of people. Be sensitive to their culture. Be sensitive to their culture. Build bridges. Be leaders. The future is yours. Be leaders. In conclusion, I like to inspire everyone to take a stand and be counted. If you see something injustice happening to a person or a group of people because of the color of their skin or the way they pray, may it be in church, synagogue, or mosque, or any other differences, do not pretend you don't see, you don't know, it's not your business. You see, my friends, it is everybody's business. What happened to you in Europe, it can happen to any group of people. The history can repeat, can repeat. It will repeat when people remain silent. And so, look what happened just not long ago. All these young, beautiful people that die in school, that murdered. For what? And it's happening all over the world. You need to take a stand. You need to speak against it. Do whatever you can as a group, as a person. One person can save. One person can save a lot of people. Speak out. And may God bless you. And may God bless United States of America my beautiful adapted country with these choices, blessings, and I thank you.
kids might have uh, read Ellie Wiesel's Night. Today. Some of them, yeah. Mm -hmm. Why don't you explain a little bit about our connection with Ellie Wiesel? Ellie Wiesel, a Nobel Prize prize winner. He wrote the book. Uh, he wrote many books. Uh, by the way, The Night. This is most probably famous, and I don't know if you ever had a chance to read that. But uh, he was together in concentration camp with my husband. And uh, he spoke most of the time, his books were most of the time about, about what happened, the, the Holocaust, and uh, how unjust, how unjust it is. Unless you can ask me questions about it, so I answer. Have, have can you describe how he came to Walsh? How uh, Joe yes. connected with him? Yes, my um, <coughs> for quite a few years, um, Walsh University actually invited, invited him. And that's for the first time my husband, they were together in the same in the same concentration camp, Elie Wiesel. Do you know who Elie Wiesel is? Okay. Elie Wiesel and my husband were in the same concentration camp. And they are about the same age. I think my husband may be even older a little bit. I don't know. But they, uh, they for the first time, they connected. And that was, uh, that was it was really something. They, they embrace each other and, and cry and cry. My husband comes from a very large family. He was the only one that left. He had 11 siblings, <laughs> so, so he was the only one alive. And Nelly Wiesel, of course, lost everybody. His, uh, I don't remember, his father, I think, was, uh, his father survived. I'm not so sure, I forget already. But, um, yeah, so. Yeah, he invited to Walsh, but also to the university, uh, Kent State University. He also spoke there, and he, he was speaking. He just passed away not long ago. I he kept in touch with with us all through through all the years. So I have quite a few letters from him. Yeah. So. Any questions, anybody? Who would like to go first? Yeah. I can't hear you, honey. What is the scariest memory, like your scariest memory? The scariest memory is not knowing why this is happening. Because I was in the ghetto standing here, and over the barbed wire, I saw a whole bunch of kids on the other side playing and in sunshine. And here I am behind the barbed bar bar wire, and I didn't know why. What have I done? What have I done to be here and they are playing over there, you know? And that, that, that was the scariest thing, not knowing. And you can mention, you know, how about when you were hiding in the, in the drawer when the uh, Nazis came with the dog? The, if in the ghetto, from time to time, like at least once or twice a week, the Nazis would come to the ghetto with the German shepherds. And when they saw a, a person covered with prayer shawl, uh, they would let the dogs out. And watching the, 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 the person being ripped apart, the, the German shepherds, like three or four of them, they rip apart, and they were making pictures and laughing, and laughing there, and they were making pictures. I remember seeing that, I got so scared, I ran fast, First upstairs, we were on the second floor and hid myself in the in the drawer. In, it got into the drawer and, and thinking that any moment they will come upstairs and, and do the same thing to me. Why they were doing, I never understood it because there was nobody that would explain. Nobody talked to the children and nobody explained. So anyway, so that's, that's what it was. So. Yeah, is there any other questions? I wish somebody, yes? In the years after, did your mom ever talk about your dad? Pardon? Did your mom ever talk about your dad after this all happened? She, she, 
Well, yeah, but she didn't know exactly what happened because he took my two sisters and they went, uh, they went, uh, apparently she thought that they went into the forest, they ran away to the forest to the partisans. But they, uh, yeah, but there were partisans, many different groups. Do you know what's partisans? They, they are f freedom fighters, uh, you know. And uh, there are many groups, and some of the groups didn't get along with each other. So, <laughs> so, um, so yeah, so that's what, that's what she thought that that's what happened. But she didn't know. So we, I don't know where my father's grave is. I don't know where they are, uh, my sisters or the rest of the family. I don't know. You know, I was invited to the state house. Uh, uh, Kasich, uh, Governor Kasich invited me to speak, and uh, I, I had only 15 minutes to speak. So after I spoke, he invited me to his office and wanted to know more. So I told him, and then he told me that uh, his story that he was brought up by, by his grandparents because his parents uh, died very young in some accident. So I told him, I say, Governor, you know, you have at least a place where you can go sit down and pray and meditate and to their graves. Where will I go? What should I? So I remember he took my hand and he says, Barbara, here on this ground, we're going to build a monument for your parents and for the six millions that die and for the liberators that liberated them here. Well, I, I was overwhelmed when he told me that. I, but you know what? Deep in my heart, I, I wasn't quite believing him because I thought, oh my gosh, something like this here on Grant. To the day that he promised, he built the biggest monument right now in, in, a, 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 in Ohio, in Columbus. You can see it with the names, with this. And I was, I was there, and, uh, uh, and it was amazing, amazing, amazing monument for all six million and the liberators. Um, so, uh, yeah. Um, yes? How were you able to like, keep all your emotions and to be able to have a right frame of mind during the Holocaust? There is not a day in my life that goes by that I don't remember. I wish I didn't. You cannot erase this from your mind. However, I learned to put in the bag because I raised a beautiful family. I have two children. My son is here and, <laughs> and I have a daughter and I have three grandchildren, uh, boys, you know. And, and so in order for me to do that, and I am a nurse, by the way, I, uh, I have been uh, for many, many years. And so for, for me to have a normal life, I have to put this in the back of my mind, but it's always there. It's always there. I don't, I remember the women that were falling into that grave with their babies, still alive. I remember the ghetto that were that were that and, and the, the dogs that were tearing apart this poor man i remember starvation I, I remember all those things i remember the buses that came and picked up all these kids and later we found out that they were guests in the buses those children in the buses they were guests so i remember those things but i put it in the back of my mind in the back of my mind. Try to. Send. Yeah, it's not a very pretty picture. But you know, yours is the future. You, you can change it. You can change it. You can, it doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be like this. You speak out, and how do you change it? You speak out. You, you, this is a wonderful <laughs> instrument that we have. We speak out. When you see something happening in school or outside, stand up. Stand up and take, and take a stand. You know, it's, it's easy. It's not that difficult. It's not that difficult. Stand up when you see something misjustice is happening to another person because of the color of the skin, because of the religion, because of, of any other differences. 
speak out. Do something about it. And don't be silent. And don't say it's not my business. It's, it is your business. Because what happened to me, it can happen to anybody, to any group of people. So, OK? Yes? I love America. This is actually, I lived, look, I was born in, in Vilna, which is now Lithuania. Then I came to Poland. Then where I was in Czechoslovakia. Then in Italy. This is the country that I love. This is the country that adapted me, and I adapted it. And I love this country with all my heart, with all my heart and soul. And I'm so great. So grateful. Yes. Ended up in Canton, Ohio. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Why don't you explain uh, the funny you mentioned how you saw, uh, never saw a parking meter before? <laughs> I thought it's for horses to keep the horses. <laughs> I came. I, I never was in a little uh, in, in a little city. So I was the place where I was born called Vilnius, which is a capital city of Lithuania. And, uh, and I came from large cities all the time. And even when I came from Israel, you know, this is also Tel Aviv and Haifa, beautiful big cities. And here I came to Canton. It's a teeny tiny country. You know, and I see the meters. I had no idea. I thought it's to put the horses there, to tie the horses <laughs> there. I, I had no, no idea. And yet, and yet I, I have learned to live here uh, and I, uh, I learned the language so fast, you have no idea. I, I, I wanted to learn, I wanted to become American so, so fast. I became uh, the citizen fast, and I, and I love this country with all my heart, with all my heart and soul. And I consider this as my country. I have never, never would want to be How any other place. you came to uh, New York for the first time? Oh, more, more. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, <laughs> they took me out to dinner, and they they wanted they order. I, I didn't know what to order. I had no idea, so they ordered a, a T-bone steak. This, it was so big; it was it was would be bigger enough for for the whole family in Europe, and they and the and the blood was coming out, and I thought, oh dear God, they didn't kill. <laughs> <laughs> they didn't kill enough that, that whatever that was. And uh, yeah, yeah, I, but I have learned. I have learned since then. How I, old were you then? Uh, 19, 19, when I came to the United States, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I was in, for a little, for a short time in the Israeli army. That was a big mistake. <laughs> that uh, that uh, that was a big mistake that they did it. That they, because <laughs> from convent to uh, Israeli army, that's not a good thing. <laughs> not a good thing. Yes. So they lifted their hands up to the heaven when I left. I know, because <laughs> I I was uh, I I didn't speak the language yet uh, so well, so I couldn't explain. So from the bus, they the military police came and took us out. From the and whoever looked the army, you have to be 17 or 18 years old. They took the army, now it doesn't matter, boys or girls. But I couldn't tell them that I am a, that I am a, to start a nursing school pretty soon. So I didn't know how to explain. They didn't listen anyway. So they they put us on a, on a, in the auto uh, and took us to the to the army. And before I knew, I went through the training. And let me tell you, the Israeli training is not very easy. And I wasn't a very good student, that's for sure. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, um, yeah, by the time my mother found out where where I was, and and uh, it took a long time until they got me out of there. It was, and they lift their hands up to the heaven when I left. And, you know, the <laughs> Israeli army didn't need anybody like me, that's for sure. So, yeah. For four years, you were raised Catholic. How do you reconcile that education with your background of being Jewish? Well, 
I was raised <coughs> for four years uh, as a Catholic, and I believed with all my heart uh, and soul. But b don't forget, before that, I was also taken to a church by, I had a, <laughs> I'm not supposed to say that my, 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 my sister tells me that this is pretentious, that we had a nanny, a, a lady that took care of us because my mother worked. My mother was a seamstress and she had to work, so she had to have somebody to take care of the kids. So she had a lady that lived with us. <coughs> She was going to a church, so she took us uh, almost every time when she went to a church. So I wasn't, it wasn't like something that I didn't know, you know. So uh, I, I knew the prayers and stuff like that. Uh, she went to Catholic church and I went with her. So I feel very comfortable. Right now, as a matter of fact, I am very much involved with the, uh, the university the, uh, here. Uh, Walsh University, I take care of the brothers there, you know, so it's, uh, it's very close to my heart, very close to my heart. They help me, yes? Did your, how did your mother respond to you? Did it bother her that you've been raised by, by No, Catholics or no, no, she was grateful. She was very grateful we were alive, you know. She was very grateful, but she, I tried to get her to church, but I didn't succeed for some reason. She did went to, a, to church enough to take us out, but um, uh, she continued to go to synagogue. Yeah. Yeah. So, yes? You talked about how you were a nurse. How was your journey becoming a I... Um, when I was uh, still in Europe, uh, I wanted to go, or in Israel, I wanted to go to medical school, uh, so, but n never stayed long enough to, to do that. So when I came to United States, I just went to, s to school and, uh, and became a nurse. Timken Mercy. <laughs> yeah. And became a nurse. And I liked it. I worked for more than 30 years. But I, w I worked. I worked for uh, in uh, Timken Mercy for a short time, and then I went to Cleveland, to uh, where the Holocaust survivors. Uh, there was a nursing home for Holocaust survivors, and that's where I went because that's where my heart. I wanted to help them, and I could speak many languages, so I, I, I could, you know, I could. Anybody can give a pill. Anybody can give an injection, but you know, to speak and to, you know, to know what's going on. I, I know I could help them, so I was traveling uh, for 30 years. I was traveling back and forth to Cleveland to Menorah Park. That's where I took care of the survivors. Hmm? One question. Yes. Oh. You about some of this stuff yes. That normal, like regular nurses would not think. No, that's right. That's right. Uh, and the reason that I was working there, I knew I could work here. We had a lot of hospitals over here, but I knew that I can do something, something that they, you know, that I understand them. So uh, they try to give a shower to uh, to some of the residents in uh, in Menorah Park. And, and the people were screaming and, and, and be afraid because you see the showers, the showers, that's, that's how they, that's how they, that's how Nazis were killing people, telling them you're going to shower and instead of a shower, a guest came out, you know? So you don't give a shower to a person, a Holocaust survivor, you don't give shower, you just wash them with a cloth and then water, you know, or, or in a bathtub or something, but don't give a shower. So that's, the, that's one of the things that, there are another, another thing that people were, uh, the Holocaust survivors, they were ho hoarding food. It's not that they were hungry now, it's because they were hungry then. So you don't take away the, the stuff. The other nurses didn't understand. 
So they took the, f the, 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 the food, was star the, mm, started to rot. So they would take away, and that was a terrible thing. Don't take away, bring new things, and then take the old ones, you know. And so I had to educate the nurses there continuously how to, how to behave uh, with the Holocaust survivors. They are not quite, they are not easy people. Then also, they, when they get very old, sometimes they reverse to their native language and they don't speak English anymore. So, so how to communicate with them. And so, um, yeah, so that was my most of, most of the time my, my duty to do that. Walking from one unit to another, seeing that things going well for my Holocaust survivors. So that's okay. Did I bore you enough? No, apparently <laughs> I apologize for the phone going off. Apparently, it's just. <laughs>